Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving the opportunity to present my work here. So today I'll be talking about constraints on parity violating conformal field theories in D equals 3. Uh, this is based on the recent work with Justin and Shiroman. So let me begin by first motivating the problem. Uh, conformal field theories in D equals 3 are of interest from holographic as well as condensed matter perspective. Uh, an important feature in such conformal field theories is the fact that the relevant examples need not preserve parity. That is, there can be a chern simmons term in such theories. And there has been a systematic study of such uh, theories in recent years. So let us consider a, a conformal field theory in D equals 3 with a conserved U1 current J and conserved stress tensor T. Uh, and let the theory be parity validating. So the conformal invariance restricts the structure of three-point functions in such theories to be of this form. This is the JJT and this is the TTT structure, where you can see the, the free boson denotes that this is the correlator for a real free boson, while the subscript free fermion denotes that uh, this is the correlator for real free fermions. And this parity odd structure uh, is unique to D equals 3. And uh, the, this, this free boson and free fermion structure, these are the parity invariant structures. They were first found by Osborne and Petku in their paper. And this is the new addition to this literature by Giombi Prakash and Yin. So this, the, uh, as I said, the numerical coefficients NS and NF cor correspond to the parity invariant sector, while uh, PJ or PT is a parity violating coefficient. Uh, this structure is unique to D equals 3, and, uh, and it appears only for interacting theories. Uh, as an example, I have written down the parity violating structure for uh, the JJ current correlator. So you can see that this part, this quantity, so the JJT correlator is defined like this. And the, the uh, this part, the T mu, this uh, this tensor structure, this was found by Osborne and Petko. This is the parity invariant tensor structure. And in D equals three, one can also write down this tensor structure, which, as you can see, because of the presence of this epsilon tensor, violates parity. So similar structures can be written down for JJT as well as TTT. And uh, so the question we would like, like to ask is that, can there be any sort of constraints on the parameter space of these three-point functions? That is, can there be a constraint on the parameters amongst the parameters NS, NF, and PJ, or PT? So it seems that in D equals 4, there is a method to do so, and that is the to the conformal collider. What is, what is the you're writing there, the T and? Oh, uh, the, the, uh, I'm writing down the three-point function of stress, uh, sorry, current. T is defined. T is defi defined, yeah. It, this is the usual thing that one would expect, but D equal, in D equals 3, one can also write down this structure, and that is the parity violating structure. So in D equals 4, or in a higher dimensions, you have this formalism by Hoffman and Maldacena that uh, 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 there are something called conformal collider bounds, which put constraints on the parameter parity even coefficients of three-point functions. Uh, so what are these? So we effectively, they effectively study the effect of localized perturbations at the origin. The integrated energy flux per unit angle over the states created by such perturbations uh, is measured at a large radius r. So what do I mean by that? So it is essentially one measures this, one calculates this quantity over states created by the stress tensor or currents. And uh, uh, this, uh, this functional E is a function of n hat, where n hat is a unit vector in uh, the, on, on the sphere which specifies the direction where I put my detector. 
and O is the operator creating the perturbation. So essentially, we are basically looking at three point functions of either J or T. Or, yeah. So we demand that such a quantity, the, this expectation value of this energy functional over the states that I just defined, must be positive. And uh, this leads to a set of constraints on the parameters depending on the, uh, the creation operator O. For example, uh, in the well-known TTT three-point function uh, admits a similar decomposition uh, as, as we saw, like the, like the similar to the D equals three, but instead there are no parity violating structures here. Instead we have this, uh, this TTT vector, which is basically the contribution due to both on, uh, I mean gauge fields. So the positivity of energy flux constraints then mean that these inequalities must be satisfied for any conformal field theory, where T2 and T4 are dimensionless parameters, which depend on these NS, NF, and NV, as you can see. So we want similar set of constraints for our field theory, uh, for our conformal field theories in D equals three. But now we, uh, there, there will be a parity violating part also in the thing. Yeah, well, the thing is that, I mean, Hartman and all, uh, they show that this, actually they show that the essentially, this E expectation value of E uh, greater than zero, this becomes basically the yeah average null energy condition. So Hartman and all they argue that this must be true for any yeah yeah they claim that this is yeah like they I mean they are, they don't say anything explicitly yeah yeah. So, so let me explain the, the, this positivity, what is the positivity of energy flux. So we consider perturbations at the origin of a Minkowski space CFT, where the metric of the CFT is this. These perturbations evolve and spread out time, and in order to measure the flux, we, we consider concentric circles, and of course, in higher dimensions, this, this means we have to consider concentric spheres. And the energy, uh, the, that, the quantity that we'll be measuring is this quantity. This, uh, this is a flux of energy over a sphere of radius r. And as, uh, as I said before, this quantity n hat denotes the position of the detector on that large sphere of radius r. And we demand that uh, the expectation value of such a state, uh, such a quantity over any state must be positive. Also note that, I mean, we can also place the detector. So initially what we are working with is that the definition suggests that we take a, our finite sphere of radius r, calculate the energy flux over it, and then extend the radius to infinity. We can also do the following, we can just go to the null infinity, place our detector there, and calculate the energy flux. These two definition, definitions are equivalent, and we'll be following the second one because of the ease of computation. So uh, in order to uh, calculate the energy flux at null infinity, we introduce the light cone variables. Uh, so this is my definition of light cone variables. And we place our detector in the y direction. So therefore, the energy functional in the, uh, in, then takes up this form, where we have considered only contributions from the future null infinity. Now, yeah, so we are, will be uh, considering the expectation value of this energy functional for states created by stress tensor or current perturbations. The, the states which create the perturbations are Norm, are defined and normalized like this, where this O, this uh, operator O, are, op, are to be constructed from current or stress tensors with definite polarizations. 
uh, uh, so uh, if if we are, if we want a, uh, to, the state to be created by a stress tensor, the O uh, uh, assumes this sort of a form. If if you are considering excitations due to a cut, the operator assumes this sort of a form. Now, uh, so. Let us now look at an example where uh, the, the energy functional for uh, states created by cuts, say. So uh, remember, recall that we are using conserved currents and uh, uh, tr symmetric traceless uh, stress tensors. So for uh, conserved currents, that means the polarization in the operator uh, O uh, it's constrained to be of this form in d equals three. This is one of the choice of independent polarizations that can one can have that satisfies that uh, that the, uh, the conservation of current. So that means that we are uh, this results in the energy matrix as uh, as I have written down here. So we are basically taking the energy functional E and sandwiching between the two states O dagger and O. And uh, I've written down one matrix element explicitly in order to make this clear. Uh, for example, the, uh, I've uh, written down in detail this, the upper left diagonal matrix. So this essentially, as you can see, is basically uh, the expectation value of T minus minus sandwiched between two Jx, the X component of the stress tensor. And the and in the denominator, you have the normalization of the the normalization of the this op operator. How we define the operator O, that is essentially the two-point function of the current. Yes, yes, yes. The off-diagonal components will be cross terms. So, so the. The condition that, so now since that we have now a matrix, uh, the condition of positivity of energy flux then translates to the fact that the eigenvalues of this energy matrix must be positive. So uh, I'll just proceed with the calculation then. So basically we are uh, ex now looking at the three point function of two J's and T's at certain limits and performing integrals over them. So I've written down the three-point function of two j's and uh, one t. Uh, so this the the first line is the parity invariant part, which was uh, which is uh, due to Osborne and Pitku, while the second part is the parity violating part. P j is the parity odd coefficient that occurs in front of the tensor structure, and it was found by uh, Shiroman and his collaborators. Huh? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll be explaining that term the, in detail, like calculations corresponding to that term. So, uh, so we, for, so now we also have the denominator, which uh, is the, I mean, the two-point function. So we need details about the two-point function also. So the two-point function is defined like this. It also depends on the NS and NF variables, uh, like this. One point is that the parity even part, the three-point function, uh, will contribute to the diagonal elements of the energy matrix, while the parity odd part will contribute to the off-diagonal elements of the energy matrix. So let me explain in a bit more detail the, how we do the calculation corresponding to uh, parity, one of the parity odd parts in JJT correlated. So I have written down uh, explicitly the structure, the tensor structures of Q1 and S1, where this epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3 are the polarization vectors that we chose earlier. That we uh, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 correspond to the uh, the current polarization, while epsilon 1 is corresponding to the T polarization. And as you can see, the parity violating structure, uh, ep this epsilon, this epsilon tensor, the antisymmetric epsilon tensor, occurs in the S1. 
So uh, in the previous slides, as you can see, the S1, S3, and S2 all have that parity violating epsilon tensors. So uh, that's the source of the parity violating structure. Yeah. No, sorry. No, in three dimensions there are no. Uh, yeah, for parity violating theory, actually there is there is a contact term which is parity violating, but uh, f for us it doesn't matter because of the choice of polarizations that we'll take. There is of course a contact term like I'll, I'll write down. So for example, uh, uh, J mu J mu will be proportional to epsilon uh, mu nu lambda del lambda this sort of a structure but for the polarizations that we will work with it won't contribute and in general what is the coefficient of the contact uh, that I am not sure. I am not actually sure. I have seen the there is a coefficient, but I am not sure whether uh, there is an uh, expansion of that coefficient in terms of NSNF. I am not sure of that. So yeah. So let me begin the computation. Uh, so uh, as I said that parity violating, we checked that the parity violating structures contribute only to the off-diagonal elements of the stress tensor, uh, sorry, the energy functional. So the appropriate choice of polarizations is that the, we have Jx, the Jy, with the T minus minus sandwiched in between them. So effectively, we are looking at this correlator and performing all sorts of limits and integrals over this. So for this, particular choice of polarizations, uh, the parity violating structure assumes this uh, form. This is the explicit form I have, uh, I'm, I've written down. So, so therefore, the, so for that highlighted part in the correlator, uh, the, uh, the contribution of that part to the energy functional is then this ratio, where the where the numerator is the usual uh, the, the limit taking and integral part of the three point function, while the denominator is the uh, the two point function normalization of the operators. So you can see here in the parity odd part also it does not appear. The, the, there is only j x j x, so this does not click in the two point function ever. So uh, before we begin the computation, we first notice that the correlator that I have written down is not time ordered. So, but the but physically, it one must insert the energy functional in between the states created, by, and uh, in between the states creating it and the one annihilating it. So, how do we achieve this this sort of time ordering? So. We assign the operator to the left, a larger imaginary part in time than the operators to the right. So for example, the, if uh, the coordinate of, so it's, if say this is Tx1 and Jx0, so then corresponding to this, T1 will be, I'm assigning T1 minus I epsilon, while this, I'll assign t minus 2i epsilon. So this is the time ordering that will follow. Therefore, because of this assignment, uh, the light cone coordinates also change appropriately. And yeah, so this, so then we first, as we said that we want to put the detector at null infinity. Therefore, we take the limit x plus uh, x1 plus going to infinity at the very beginning. And then we perform the integral over x1 minus by Schwinger parameterization. Uh, this, uh, the integrals performed in this manner give the same result as the analytic continuation of the even dimensional integrals. Instead of doing the integrals uh, in odd dimensions, one can just analytically continue the even dimensional integrals. Um, they seem to agree. 
So, uh, and the rest of the integrals of the, over the spatial coordinate x is performed by uh, integrating along the spatial direction x first, followed by the light cone directions x plus minus. So, I have written down the final result. So, the numerator is this, where you can see the contribution from um, the parity validating coefficient pj, while uh, the denominator is the two point function and it's defined in terms of c and e. So, the, so now you have to perform the same thing for all the terms in the three-point function uh, separately, term by term, and we result, it, it results in the following energy matrix. So the diagonal contribution is due to the parity even part of the uh, correlator, while the off-diagonal part is due to the, um, the parity violating part of the correlator. Uh, where A2 and AJ, uh, alpha J, are defined in terms of NF and NS and PJ as shown. So now we know that, like from Hoffman and Maldacena's analysis, that this, the, the diagonal elements are always positive. So therefore, what we, the, the condition that the eigenvalues must be positive translates to the fact that uh, the determinant of this matrix must be positive. So as a result of that, we land up in this uh, co constraint on A2 and alpha J. Consequently, we have a constraint on NF, NS, and PJ. So basically, what I'm saying is that uh, the, the, the parameter space is bounded by a circle. So the allowed values of allowed values for a conformal field theory must lie within this circle then uh, in presence of a parity violating part. In absence of a parity violating part, this just reduces to a line on it. So we can perform the similar analysis uh, for the uh, states created by stress tensor insertions. And uh, as before, we choose certain polarizations, which are consistent with the fact that it's a conserved stress tensor as, and spaceless. So the, we chose this combination of polarizations. And as before, we have the energy matrix, where now we are sandwiching T between two stress tensors instead of two currents. Uh, the diagonal element is again uh, this T minus minus, but now it's sandwiched between two T X Y stress tensors. And the denominator is again the two point function of the stress tensor. Just to give you a magnitude of the calculation, it's uh, like we have to perform the same analysis for all of this, like all this parity violating structure, the six parity violating structures as well as the parity event structures. And what we get is this uh, energy matrix. Uh, so uh, as before, the parity even part corresponds to the diagonal components, while the parity violating part is the off-diagonal contribution to the energy matrix. Uh, I have introduced two dimensionless variables, alpha 4 and alpha t, uh, t4 and alpha t, where they are related to ns, nf, and pt like this. Again, similarly, uh, we see that the positivity of energy flux then means that it must, the t4 and t4 and alpha t must tie within this circle of radius 4. So now we would like to test our uh, our uh, this bound against some theory which actually has parity violating structures. So one of the th one of such theories is the UN Chern Simmons theory at level kappa, uh, uh, coupled to either fermions or bosons in the fundamental representations. They have parity violating structures. And the important part is that in large limit, all, all the, uh, this can be solved to all orders in the tooth coupling. So now, uh, uh, the, from the analysis of Maldasena Jibodev, we find that the tens, uh, NS and NF are, have this particular form, 
while pj and P, pt have this uh, this sort of forms where alpha and alpha prime are two uh, arbitrary constants which need to be uh, we need to fix from a one loop calculation so why do we need to fix that it's uh, So, in the the three point function uh, in the three point function of say j j t, we had some free boson plus free fermion, while and some p j times parity odd. Now, this structure in the analysis of Maldasena and Zibodev, the normalization of this structure was such that this alpha and alpha prime were one. But the normal, so now we have to fix the normalization of alpha and alpha prime in the tensor structure representation that we are, the normalization of the tensor structure that we are using. And we fix it from a one loop computation in, in this UN Chan Simmons theory. So this, uh, so this has been already done before, and we redo, a, redo this uh, in order to precisely determine the factors alpha and alpha prime. So uh, these are the alpha and alpha prime factors that we get. And plugging everything in, we find that A2, alpha j, T4, and alpha t assume this particularly simple form, such that this constraint, recall that constraint that uh, alpha j square plus a2 square less than or equal to 4 and alpha t square plus t4 square minus 16. We, you, if you just plug this, uh, plug the values in into this inequality, you find that for large in Chan Simmons theories, this is satisfied. So the, these theories actually lie on the bo boundary of the disk that uh, is allowed for conformal field theories. So this is a pictorial representation of this. So you can see that the bounding circle is given by the large and Chan Simmons theories. Oh, these are the free boson and free fermion limits. And so, so summarizing everything, so what we have obtained is that we have obtained our constraints on parameters of uh, JJT and TTT for that apply to all oh, sorry. that that apply to all that is parity both parity even and parity or uh, conformal field theories in D equals three and in particular if we label the parameters uh, uh, the, by like I have done before that A2 alpha J correspond to the uh, JJT correlator uh, while T4 and alpha T correspond to the TTT correlator they are they are bound to lie within a disk, as is evident from this, these inequalities. We have explicitly shown that for la large N Chern Simmons theories, uh, UN Chern Simmons theories with single fundamental boson or fermion, these, these parameters lie on the bounding circle of this disk. And uh, it will be interesting to generalize these observations to excitations created by higher spin operators. Yeah. That's all. Uh, uh, so when uh, something saturates the bound like this, when you're on the uh, bounding circle, typically then there is some sort of uh, special property. In, yeah. Like in the BPS case, you get some additional uh, in when things saturate the BPS bound, then there are some operators that annihilate the states uh, and so on. Is there any analogous thing here because this... Uh, it bound, yeah. yeah uh, but uh, so that means there's some null state or something, right? Uh, the, isn't that... Uh, yeah. Delta is J, J plus S. S. So that uh, because, yeah. uh, because in the large N limit, that is not yeah. corrected. Yeah. So that's why... Uh, um, so that bound, uh, so it's the null state to do with that conserved current, I see. Yeah. 
But that may be if, from the logic that you said. Uh, so you, maybe it follows from the fact that this matrix uh, has some zero eigenvalue or something. No, uh, this two by two matrix yeah. uh, uh, has some zero eigenvalue, yeah, which you, you can maybe translate to a statement yeah. Uh, yeah. To, uh, of the null. I mean, yeah. the fact that there is some del mu exists. Some polarizations, for, uh, some polarization, uh, for. which. Uh, uh, and the other then the question that sort of follows then from that is uh, at finite n will you be in the interior of the disk? Yeah, that's one we are also trying to see. Like. So this uh, correction to this delta equal to uh, you know s kind of uh, correction, the twist corrections. Can you relate it to where you are on this disk? That's the maybe. I mean, uh, if you can just put, let's say, an, you know, energy momentum tensor exchange. Yeah. Just uh, and then ask. If, uh, what I'm asking is that you know, like, if uh, if there's a T exchange or a J exchange, mm. and uh, you know the three-point functions. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you say something about? We haven't thought. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That has not been in uh, out in literature. Yeah. So the, the positivity of the uh, the average null energy condition requires unitarity. Uh, yeah, that implies. Like, I mean, yeah, that was proved by Hartman and all that. Any for any interacting unitary conformal field theory have this uh, saturation of this uh, that it must be a positive. Some interesting bounds or constraints for non-unitary theories as well. Is, is that something that? Uh, don't we? Yeah. So thank you, Shiva. Yeah.